There are three types of Mac users. Those who pay the Apple tax and spend 1200 bucks to get four terabytes of storage on their M4 Pro Mac Mini, or if you're a little more frugal, you can buy a Thunderbolt 5 enclosure for 200 bucks and slap in a four terabyte NVMe for just over 400 bucks. That's three times less. Or the third type, you can still take 60% off Apple's tax and DIY an internal four terabyte upgrade. It's not really easy, but it is possible even on the M4 Pro. I covered the regular M4 Mini a few months ago, but it can only go up to two terabytes. The Pro upgrades go up to four. And when I covered that two terabyte upgrade on my Mini, it was under 300 bucks. But now the price on that upgrade went up and I've been talking to some of the people who actually manufacture these upgrades who sell it for less. So besides the confusion over who's actually making and selling these upgrade kits, I was wrong about one important part of this upgrade process, specifically which Mac models work with the DFU restore process. So in this video, I'm gonna clear those things up. I'm gonna upgrade my dad's M4 with my old drive, then I'm gonna see if this M4 Pro can be upgraded to four terabytes DIY style. And this isn't just for fun, my dad just retired and I wanted to give him a nice video editing rig here at the studio for Gearling engineering videos. If you're not subscribed over there, I got a link in the description. We do some pretty fun things and I'd hate for you to miss them. Before we get to the Pro, I had my dad bring over his Mac Mini and he bought one with 512 gigs. The old drive I pulled from my Mini was one terabyte, so I wanted to see if I could just drop it into his machine. The process was exactly the same, but this time around I could do it a lot more quickly. The three big things I learned between the last video and now were first, you don't have to disconnect the power button. As long as you're careful, you can just set the cover aside with the power button connected. I've seen enough people break the power button connector, I just recommend not doing it. Second, after you finish replacing the drive, you have to restore the Mac using DFU mode, which requires another Mac. But you don't need an Apple Silicon Mac. A lot of Intel Macs will work for the same restore process. And third, what about warranty support? I think if you're overly cautious, you could always put your original SSD back in, but honestly, it's up to Apple, so this upgrade should be done at your own risk. I will say, Apple has an official support guide for replacing the SSD module, so take that for what it's worth. Now, I mentioned that there were some pricing shenanigans. I hate when this happens because it makes me look like an idiot when I publish a video saying the upgrade is $259, which it was, but then when people actually go buy it, it's more. I mean, $320 is still a good deal, but that's more than a $60 increase in the past few months. But that was Expand Mac Mini, who initially reached out to me. I've been in touch with another vendor, M4 SSD, and they said that they can keep their costs lower because they're actually manufacturing the boards, not just reselling the things that are made by others. And looking at their pricing, it was 300 bucks back when I made my first video, and it's actually 299 now, so it's a buck cheaper. So I guess the moral of the story is this. Do your shopping. <laughs> I made sure to link to both vendors in my last video, but by the time you're watching this video, things may change again. So if you see a deal that seems off, just don't do it. Anyway, let's take a look at the storage options for this M4 Pro. Looking at Apple's website, the upgrade prices are just insane. $600 for two terabytes, 1200 for four, or a whopping 2400 for eight. And some people have argued Apple storage is faster than the commodity M.2 storage you can get for PCs, but that's outdated information. Apple initially had a lead when they started moving over to NVMe storage in their Macs, but once PCIe Gen 4 and 5 came around, the fastest NVMe drives, which are three times cheaper than Apple's upgrade prices, are on par now. Anyway, there's no good reason you should pay Apple that much money for their storage upgrades. So there are two options if you still want multiple gigabytes per second of performance, external Thunderbolt storage and an internal DIY upgrade. Right here, I have an eight terabyte Sabrent Rocket 4 Plus SSD that I bought for about a thousand bucks. And then I have a $200 80 gigabits Thunderbolt 5 enclosure from M4 SSD. I'm gonna put these together and test them against the internal SSD. Then I'll upgrade the internal SSD using this four terabyte upgrade kit, also from M4 SSD, and see how it performs. Now, I paid for this Sabrent drive, but just to be clear, M4 SSD sent me these two things for my testing. And this isn't the only option. I'm currently using an Acasis Thunderbolt 5 enclosure for my main editing Mac, and I did a video comparing that to a couple Ugreen options over on my second channel, Level 2 Jeff. I'll link to that video in the description. The first step, getting a quick performance baseline. I set up the Mac Mini with just a local account so I could run Amorphous Diskmark and Blackmagic Disk Speed Test, and here are the results. For larger files, between three to seven gigabytes per second. 
Thinking back to some of my first computers, these numbers are still mind-boggling to me. Anyway, the performance does tail off for random small file access, but that's normal for all storage. Next, I wanted to see how an external drive would compare. Now, this is an 8TB PCIe Gen 3 drive. Presumably, you could get a Gen 4 drive and get even more speed than I can get here. But storage can be tricky too, because there's a lot of metrics for these drives that matter that manufacturers conveniently hide away. Like, will it write at max speed continuously, or does it get really slow after a minute or two? And can it handle random access well? Also, why can't we get 120 gigabits on Thunderbolt 5? Why only 80? Well, that's because 120 gigabits is only for display mode. So if you see any drives advertising 120 gigabits, that's just marketing. It's not true. Anyway, installing the drive is easy, and I'm glad M4 SSD includes a little Phillips driver and a thermal pad. There's a small fan in the end, but after I plugged it in and tested it, the drive never got loud. It's, it's about the same amount of noise, maybe even a little less than my $300 Acasis enclosure. But plugging it into the Mac and testing it, I noticed it gave me around 2 to 3 gigabytes per second. But after about a minute, or about 150 gigabytes of data transfer, the performance went way down. Now, to try to figure out why, I installed Smart Control to monitor the smart status of the drive, and that gives me drive temperatures. And I also checked temperature externally using my IR camera. And both of those showed me the drive wasn't overheating. And I don't think the storage controller was either, so my guess is the drive's own internal cache just fills up, and then it slows down to about a gigabyte per second. That's not bad, but anyone saying you should just buy an external drive and it's the same thing as upgrading the internal storage is wrong. It's not a bad option, that's not what I'm saying. Just every storage drive is different, and the internal storage on the M4 at least is going to give you way more consistent performance than most external drives. You might not need that consistency, you might not copy hundreds of gigs of files around like I do, and that's fine, but some people do. And that's why I'm including these numbers in the test results. And interestingly, once I put this all into a graph, I noticed the write speeds for smaller files is actually faster on the external drive. So I guess the bottom line is still this, every drive performs differently, but you should at least expect a few gigabytes per second for large files on any modern SSD. But moving on, let's get to upgrading the internal storage. First, we gotta flip over the mini and do a little surgery to pop off the back. And honestly, this is the most annoying part, and probably the part you might actually snap something off if you're not careful. First, you have to get a tool to go down and make a little gap between the plastic back and the aluminum body. Then you have to pry up near one of the four little retaining clips. And it's not too bad once you've done it one time, but the first time I did this, I honestly thought I was gonna break something. Anyway, once you do that, there's the power button cable just kind of hanging out over in the corner. Like I said, I don't unplug it because that connector is really fragile, and it's easy enough just to leave the bottom cover hanging over there. But then you take out all these screws, and luckily they're not security bits, and Apple's not pulling any pentalobe shenanigans here. Once you get the bottom plate off, being careful to not bend it around the semicircle fan mount, you can remove the fan, and again, I don't unplug it, I just gently set it to the side. And now we can pull out the original SSD. And I noticed when I did that, this thing looks a lot different than the replacement. Not sure if that's just something with the 512 gig SSD not needing as much space or what, but it looks like there's plenty of room in the mini for the new one and the connectors all line up fine. Anyway, after I carefully slide in the upgrade chip, I can reassemble everything, again being careful with the fan cable and then the power button connector. And that's it. I've done this three times now, and at this point, I think the only thing that really annoys me is that initial popping off of the bottom cover. Everything else in here is pretty straightforward. But flipping the Mac back right side up and plugging it in, you'll go into SOS mode. Like, literally, the little LED on the front starts blinking orange in the pattern of Save Our Ship in Morse code. I tip my hat to the engineer who decided on that instead of something boring like a red LED. And some people asked in the last video, why can't you just restore things from an external drive or something like that? But the way Apple storage works now, and this is why you can't just install any old NVMe in here, it's that you have flash chips on the little replaceable drive, but the storage controller, the part that actually knows how to store data on those flash chips, is actually part of the M4 silicon. So you have to use the DFU process. That stands for Device Firmware Update, and it makes it so you can pair the new flash chips with the existing M4 storage controller. To do that, you plug in another Mac into the middle port of the Mini using a USB-C cable, then you hold down the power button while you plug in the Mini to power. So you do need another Mac. And that Mac just has to have a T2 chip in it or Apple Silicon. So a lot of newer Intel Macs will also work. But I used my M2 MacBook Air here with Apple Silicon, and I just went through the steps to restore the firmware from scratch using Apple's guide. 
After about 20 minutes, the Mac started up, finished the firmware flashing process, and I was back in business with a fresh macOS install. I created a local user account, downloaded the benchmarking apps, and here are the results. I let the disk speed test run for like five minutes, and there was no slowdown the whole time. Amorphous Disk Mark also showed a massive speed up for writes, probably because they're spread out over more flash chips here. But comparing all three solutions, at least with the drives I used, the upgrade was the best, the original second best, and this external drive was definitely the slowest. But like I said, different SSDs will perform differently. So there you have it. Storage upgrades three ways. I know which way Apple prefers you do it, buy from them and they make maximum profit. But I know how I like doing it, and if you don't like hacking into your Mac, that's fine by me. Until next time, I'm Jeff Kierling.